there we go. Okay. You just gotta hold it like really close to your, like a, like a rock star. Um, all right, thank you, Laura, for that introduction. I was gonna sit, but I think I'll just stand. I'm, I'm a nervous walker, so I think that'll we'll do that. Um, but yeah, like Laura said, my name is Neil Shea. I'm the Restoration Program Director at Ipswich River Watershed Association. Um, I grew up in Ipswich, um, and now I'm back working here. So um, it's been a special past three years working for uh, the association, getting to know the projects that we're working on, and I was super happy when Laura extended an invite to talk to you all today about this project, which uh, I would say is one of the most important projects that, um, that we work on. So I'm very excited to give you some more details um, and then definitely leave some time for questions at the end. So um, you can go to the uh, first slide. Um, so just an overview of what, um, how I'm thinking this will go. So I'll get into a little bit of like, well, first I'll do a super quick background, but I'm assuming a lot of people here are at least somewhat familiar, and then I'll get into um, um, some, some, some objectives as to like, why are we talking about removing the dam? Why is this important, and why should you care? Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what the current status of the project is, so like where are we at today? Um, then I'll get into um, almost like a, a frequently asked question section. What else should you know about the project? Questions that I've heard a lot of um, over the past year or two that come up all the time. Um, we'll hit some talking points associated with that. Then we'll talk about what's next, what's coming up in the next few months, um, and then some Q&A. So hopefully it should be um, a good time and hopefully you uh, learned something. So next slide. Um, so quick background, I, I, I never like to spend too much time on the background just because you can get bogged down on it, but um, like Laura said, the town of Ipswich owns the dam. They bought it from um, Sylvania back in, um, I want to say, early 1980s. Um, the dam is a run of river dam, and so what that means essentially is that um, the amount of water that comes in above the dam is the same that goes over the dam. The dam doesn't hold back. Um, any water for flood control. Um, it was originally used to power mill operations, and so um, most mill operation dams are exactly that. They're a run of river dams. They're never designed to hold back much water. They're just designed to funnel water in a way where they could harness that water for power. Um, and then uh, the town of Ipswich, along with um, Ipswich River Watershed Association, the state, um, as well as a ton of other partners, have been investigating the feasibility of removing the dam since, since 2012. So this project's been going on for a long time, way past my time that I've been here. Um, so yeah, over 10 years. And so a lot of work, a lot of research, and um, one of my goals is to sum that up over, over the next little bit. So um, I put this slide together just to mostly show there's kind of six, sometimes seven, but I'll talk about six today about kind of the primary drivers as to why we're looking to remove the dam. And um, some people, you know, and I always find it interesting, some people care about all of these, some people care about one of these, and some people don't care about any of these. So I think uh, all I can do is kind of tell you why these what these reasons are, a little background into each one of them, and um, then we'll, we'll go from there. So, <clears throat> next slide, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so first up is it serves no functional use. Like, um, we alluded to, it used to be, uh, the dam used to function in a way where it would power the mills and the, and the machinery op operations associated with the mill. Um, over the course of its history, it used to, the mill building, so that facility that's now EBSCO, there used to be more buildings associated with that. It used to be a grist mill, it was a hosiery mill, it was a lace mill. Um, it was, so it's been a lot of things over the past 100 years, um, but at its core, the dam was there to uh, power the machinery. And so um, use of the dam to actually power that machinery ceased in 1928. So almost 100 years, uh, it hasn't really been used for anything. Um, no power, and it could never be used in the future to generate power either because that, the amount of power that it could um, produce is, is very minimal. So, um, and there's lots, uh, if, if anyone here is familiar with our town historian, Gordon Harris, um, I'm sure everyone is. He has a great blog, um, historicipswitch.net, that has a ton of information on the history, if that's something that is interesting to you. So I just wanted to give a little background about how there's essentially no current use. Um, second reason um, is that it's, it's a major liability. Um, the town actually just got 
guidance today from the state. Um, so the, all dams across the state are under the jurisdiction of the Office of um, Dam Safety. And so the Office of Dam Safety um, has pretty strict rules and regulations as to how dam owners are allowed to op own and operate their dam. And you have to make sure that um, you know, safety is, 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 is a priority. And so um, the type of dam Ipswich Mills is, it's a relatively small dam. It's called a low head dam. And so low head dams are pretty much anything 10 feet and under. Um, and the way that the water flows over them creates these currents called ED currents um, that are actually very dangerous. And so the, the guidance that the state, it was very timely, that they just sent this out today as a reminder that um, while these dams look unassuming and not very dangerous, they're actually one of the biggest killers across the country. And so these kinds of dams exist uh, all over the country. Um, and just the way that their hydraulics work, I think we're, we're fortunate that there has never been an incident in the time um, of Ipswich Mills Dam, at least that I can remember. Um, but you know, it's, these things happen a lot, and so it's just a matter of how that dam works, how it operates. It's kind of just an accident waiting to happen. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the other threat that has to do with liability is uh, dam, dam failure. And so this, this has come up a lot this year, actually, with all the kind of inordinate amount of rain that we've gotten out in Western Mass. Um, some of you might have heard, like, especially in Lemonster, I think they got about 10 inches of rain in 24 hours. And they had to declare a state of emergency. And there was um, multiple dams in Lemonster that they thought could fail. And so they had to evacuate people. And so, um, you know, Dams are required to be inspected every year. They're required to be up to a certain safety standard. Um, but that doesn't mean that accidents still can happen, especially when you're um, put under the pressure of just a historic amount of rain. So um, that being said, Ipswich Mills Dam, last time it got inspected, they said, well, it's in pretty good shape. It's got a lot of issues. It's got a lot of deferred maintenance, but it's not in danger of failing tomorrow. But the failure potential is still bigger than zero. Um, it, costs, uh, it costs the town money to upkeep. So like I said, the town as a dam owner is required to uh, keep upkeep the dam to a certain standard. So that means regular inspections. Um, those inspections usually reveal deficiencies like there's a crack or um, there's a leak in the dam. And so, or there's, if there's vegetation growing on the dam, that can be a problem. And so there's this laundry list of things that gets um, identified every year and it's the dam owner's responsibility to take care of those things. And the town, as much as we all love Ipswich, has been pretty negligent in taking care of the dam. There has not been significant repairs done to the dam in over a decade. Um, and just on average, aside from major repairs, it costs about ten to $20,000 in just staff time, just for like, there's a tree caught up in the fish ladder or there's um, you know, uh, some vegetation that needs to be cut down. Um, just regular stuff like that costs the town about ten dollars to $20,000 on average, which is not a lot, but it's, it's more than zero. Um, and um, and the fish, so the fish ladder that's associated with the dam is regulate, also regulated by the state, is also required to be upkept to a certain standard. And so, and that has also been negligent over the past five to ten years. So there's multiple deferred maintenance issues, um, and the dam isn't getting any younger either. And so at a certain point, you would either be staring down the barrel of significant, um, significant repairs or upgrades to make sure that dam is up to standard. And so the cost for that would be steep and those would be entirely borne out on the, on the tax, local taxpayers. <coughs> um, the dam increases upstream flood risk. And so I tried to get a good aerial shot. Um, it might be a little hard to see, but you can see at the far right, end of that photo is the dam. To the left is the dam pond or the dam impoundment. And so essentially that, how that dam works is that dam is now full. It's at, you know, it's on a regular year, it's at capacity. So there's no, the water that comes in from upstream is the same amount that goes out downstream. And so when it rains or if there's a flood, a normal river has floodplains. And so when there's a flood, a river swells up and fills those floodplains and that water can be held. Um, until maybe the rain dissipates and then the water levels go back down. At the dam, since the bathtub above the dam is essentially full and the faucet's still running, um, every drop of additional water 
like in a flood, cannot be contained within floodplains because there is no floodplain. So that's why there's a flood risk upstream that would be mitigated by dam removal. Um, hopefully that makes sense. It can be difficult to explain sometimes, but I like the bathtub analogy. Um, the bathtub is full, the faucet's still running, so water is essentially spilling over the sides, over the dam, so that's, um, you know, there's, there's no more room, essentially. Um, one of them, you know, one of the most important reasons to me is that um, the dam is ecologically damaging. Um, there's been a lot of research done both across the state and across the country as to what the impacts of these dams are. Um, above the dam, um, essentially you're creating an artificial impoundment, and that impoundment is not like a natural flowing river. The water slows down, it's more exposed to sunlight for longer parts of the day, so that water gets artificially warm. And so the warming of that water is not kind for the living animals that like to, to live in there. And so the, the warming of that water also leads to a decrease in dissolved oxygen, which all aquatic animals need to survive. So fish typically like high levels of dissolved oxygen. That's how they breathe and live. Um, where, and so the impoundment is creating this artificially warming, again, almost like a bathtub, um, that is not like your natural river environment, which can self-regulate, it can be cold, um, and, it, and can sustain the native uh, fish, and, fish and wildlife. And so um, these studies time and time again that have been done across the state show that routinely when you have a dam, the water is warmer upstream, the dissolved oxygen le levels are, are lower, and downstream, you're showing, downstream it's a return to, to natural order. The temperatures are normal, dissolved oxygen levels are higher, things tend to thrive a little bit more. So, um, <coughs> also think I mentioned that Ipswich Mills is ahead of tide dam, meaning that essentially the, the dam puts a hard stop to the extension of the tide. So downstream of the dam, believe it or not, is actually, it's, it's estuary, it's a mix of salt and fresh water. The amount of salt water is pretty low, but um, the tide also would extend way further up, about a mile further up, if the dam were to be removed. And that would be more of what we call a freshwater tide. So meaning that salt water would not mix, but essentially that fresh water would be pushed up and down on a twice daily basis by those tides. And so um, it wouldn't be, it would, it's tidal, but not in the sense you would think of where it's very salty. It's essentially like in a freshwater estuary where water levels would go up and down. So it would be more dynamic in that sense too. Um, another one of my favorite reasons is it deters fish passage. So um, there is a fish ladder at the dam, but um, fish ladders are never ideal for fish, and especially the ones that we have um, here. So believe it or not, the fish ladder that is currently installed um, <coughs> at the dam was originally designed, those types of fish ladders were designed to pass Pacific salmon. So Pacific salmon are much bigger fish species than the ones that we're looking to pass here. Our local migratory fish species are mostly river herring, and so there's Atlantic herring, there's alewife, there's American shad, there's blueback herring, there's also menhaden, but um, all these types of fish live a life cycle where they live part of their life out in the ocean and then part of, part of their life in the river. So they need to be able to easily go back and forth to reproduce, um, and so anytime you have a dam, even if that dam has a fish ladder, passage is not ideal for those fish. It's stressful for them, they can't always navigate, and they can't always find their way to where they need to be. And so dams and undersized stream crossings across the state have caused drastic decline in those, in those populations. And we've seen it. We operate a fish count station every year at the dam. We put an underwater camera in, and we actually count how many fish and uh, the numbers are depressing. It's not a lot. And so, um, <coughs> whereas even, you know, to the direct north of us, we have the Parker River, they get, you know, th they still get thousands of herring that come every year. And so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get those, those herring too, so. Oh, this is just a little fun little animation. So this is the, if you can tell, this, this is a uh, kind of wide shot of the whole Ipswich River watershed. Um, and you have some herring waiting to get in at the, at the, in, the, in the bay. You can hit next. They start to make their way up. They hit the Ipswich Mills Dam. Oh, some get scared away and they have to go back to the, out to the ocean. 
couple make it up to like Willowdale Dam, if you know where that is. But that's, uh, you know, that's a bad situation for fish, fish passage too. And even fewer make it further up um, to where in South Middleton, there's another dam called, the, it's owned by Bostick, the company. Um, and that's another dam that blocks fish passage that is actually supposed to come down this year. So very exciting to actually maybe see one of these projects happen in our own watershed. Um, but so that's, that's kind of the journey of a, of a herring. Um, you can go to the next. Uh, and, and the next after that. So then, um, and I know a lot of people, you know, this issue has become very political around town, and I, I try not to get into that um, part of it because to me it's not political. And so, but if someone were to ask me, you know, what are the reasons why we should keep the dam, to me there's, there's not many. And I think um, the most, the reasons that you would want to keep it would be that it, it looks nice. Um, I mean, my own mother loves the way the dam looks, and so <laughs> she's like, why do you want to take it out? It looks nice. I mean, it's a nice thing to look at, and so, uh, you know, that's one reason. Then also, you know, taking the dam out was essentially you would be converting what's currently a pond-like ecosystem above the dam to, to return to a river. And so um, some people like a pond. It's, it's personal preference. And so um, those are really the only two reasons. There's no ecological benefit to keeping the dam, um, there's no, you know, there's, in my mind, there's just not a ton of benefits there for keeping the dam. So um, you can go to the next. Um, so current status, um, there's, I put kind of this brief timeline up there just to really show how many years this project has been in progress. So 2013 is when we really started kind of diving into like what the options would be here. And when I say we, I mostly mean the town. The town was curious as to like, what, what are the options? And so they looked at dam removal. They looked at putting in an improved fish ladder. They looked at keeping things the same. And um, at the time, that, that group that was convened thought that we should at least look into dam removal. And so that kicked off what they call a full feasibility study. And so that's why there's such a big time gap, 2013 to 2019. It, took, it takes years to put these things together. The one that we produced is over a thousand pages long. It's great nighttime reading if you want to oh, yeah. <laughs> look at, <laughs> look into it. Lots, lots of pictures, lots of uh, graphs and photos. But um, still, it's a ton of work, a ton of research. They looked into you know every possible impact of dam removal, and so it's a really, it's a really um, impactful document. And pretty much what I try to do, and anytime I go to talk to anybody, is, is summarize. You know, how do I summarize a thousand pages? Well, I try, but it's not always easy because there's so much detail. But um, they looked into anything, you know, you name it, they looked into it. And so following 2019, we did some even more additional studies. Um, you know, EBSCO being so close to the dam and the river, we really wanted to get a good handle on how that facility is going to be impacted by dam removal. And a lot of people are concerned. I think, you know, it's a major tax base for the town. And um, there used to be more employees, that, you know, in person, but now they've gone to more of kind of a hybrid. There's not as many people, but still it's a shared goal to make sure that that, that facility is protected. So more work and research went into that. We're, we're doing outreach and engagement at every step of the way as well. And then last year um, at town meeting, there was a vote. Um, there was an article that uh, proposed uh, essentially asking the public, do you want to advance the Dips which Mills project to permitting? And that article passed 70% in favor of, of advancing to the project to permitting. Um, we also got um, some additional grant funding to allow that to happen. And then that kicked off um, entering what's called MEPA review. MEPA stands for Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act. And that's kind of the state standard for pretty much any project of a certain size has to go through this process where you have all the state agencies and officials looking at things with a magnifying glass, with a fine tooth comb, making sure that the project that you're proposing is gonna be safe, it's not gonna cause harm to the environment, and that um, it's gonna do what you said it's gonna do. Um, so we did that process last year, um, and then they came back, they wanted some more information about sediment specifically, so I'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's going into what's called an environmental impact review. Lots of acronyms. 
So I don't feel bad if you can't remember all of them. I certainly don't all the time. And so SEIR is a single environmental impact review. And essentially, that's where the project is now. We're working on that, and we're going to submit that shortly over the next month or so. So <coughs> you can go to the next slide. So this is, this is just a kind of a visual representation of some of the um, our reach uh, products that we've had. So we've had, you know, we have a fact sheet, frequently asked questions, and then kind of this new thing that we just came out with, um, just a super short pamphlet that lists all the benefits. So um, if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to provide some, some materials. All right, now I want to get into a little bit um, of the kind of most frequently asked topics. Um, and, and hopefully we might answer some of the questions you have before we get to the Q&A. Um, so how is this funded? How much is it costing the town? We hear this, get this question a lot. Um, pretty much entirely through grants, both local, state, and federal grants um, have supported this project since the beginning. And so the state division of ecological Rec restoration um, supports this project via the, their priority projects program which is highly selective. They only pick a few projects every year to support, and they only pick projects that pose significant benefits to the state. And so Ipswich Mills has been on this list since 2020, and so we get state support for the project from that. And then additionally, we were selected from um, a NOAA grant, so NOAA Federal Agency um, Oce Oceanic a Atmospheric Administration, um, highly competitive nationwide grant they selected a handful of transformational projects with wide-ranging impacts, and um, Ipswich Mills, along with a couple other dams in the area, were selected for, for funding from that. So, you know, this I, I say all this because it's a lot of people think it's just us, it's Ipswich River that's that's promoting this project. Um, it's really not. It's it's much more than that. The benefits are evident to uh, all these other agencies, um, both at the state and federal level. So um, I'd just like to, to point that out. So won't this cause damage to the environment in downtown? Nope. Next slide. No, you can <laughs> just kidding. There's a lot of a uh, lot of background on why this won't cause damage to the environment. Um, Massachusetts actually has some of the most rigorous permitting standards in the country, um, believe it or not. Both state and federal regulations would not allow this project to happen if it was going to harm the environment, harm infrastructure like the Choke Bridge or the County Street Bridge, cause damage to public resources like the shellfish beds. That's why we go through that MEPA process essentially is for every arm of the state to take a close look at the project and say, hey, you need to make sure you look at this X, Y, Z to make sure you don't hurt the shellfish populations or, or whatever. And so, um, you know, throughout this whole process, the feasibility study, we followed state and national standards for um, determining things like what are the effects on water levels? What are the potential erosion impacts downstream? What are the impacts to wildlife? So pretty much, you know, you name a concern, we've, we've looked at it and we've looked at it intently. And so um, that's kind of why this process takes so long. So um, next slide. So yeah, what about the shellfish beds? I know that a ton of people are very interested in this for good reason. Um, shellfishing is important industry to Ipswich. Um, and uh, you know, I can say for certain that dam removal will not have any negative impact on downstream shellfish beds. I know this because of the work we've put in so far and the work that we're gonna continue to put into this. So the two main concerns are sediment quantity, so amount of sediment, and then sediment quality, or how dirty is the sediment. And so part of the project, by taking the dam out, we're proposing to release a, some sediment downstream. And so um, the state requires you to say, how much are you releasing and what's in that sediment? And so we've taken a close look at both those things. We've looked at how much, and so the amount of sediment is actually relatively small compared to like how much sediment's moved around downstream at the, at the mouth of the river. So every year, you know, you get storms, just regular tides move massive amounts of sediments. The amount of sediment that would be coming down from the dam removal is a drop in the bucket compared to that. Um, additionally, um, a Set of regular sediment transport processes, so 
You can think of the river as a conveyor belt. It's constantly moving sediment downstream. That's actually, a, you know, that's a healthy part of a river. We want to promote that. And so it, it allows things like the estuary downstream to grow and, and accrete over time. And so we actually want that. We want to promote that. And so that's actually one of the reasons why when you remove a dam, you actually want to make sure if you have a nice, clean sediment, you want to send it downstream. Um, <coughs> and yeah, so happy clam. <laughs> <laughs> and so sediment quality, essentially, we're going to be doing, the state requires a super rigorous uh, sediment testing program that we're going to be doing, and that has to be done as part of the permitting process. So we'll be taking um, a lot of sediment samples and testing for, essentially, we're following the state standards for drinking water, even though this is not drinking water. Um, so it's going to be as clean as, you know, your drinking water would be. So. <coughs> Okay, for, I forgot how many questions there are. And so um, what about water withdrawals? Wouldn't keeping the pond be a good thing? And so a lot of people, um, especially during droughts, look up at the pond behind the dam and say, if we take the dam out, then we're gonna be losing this. We're losing this, uh, this water resource. And so, um, and part of this, part of the story too, is that the Ipswich River is one of the most impacted rivers in our region from water withdrawals, supplies water for a ton of communities both inside and outside the watershed and so and I'll, we like to say that that we're essentially loving the river to death people are sucking too much water out of the Ipswich River and it's a big problem um, but for the first time ever an agreement's in place between all the towns and the state to work work for alternative solutions in order to get off of Ipswich River water and find different ways to, to provide their public with with um, drinking water and so Summer water withdrawals really make low flow conditions worse. So in the summertime, you have a drought that a lot of towns actually see their need for water go up because people want to water their lawns, they want to fill their pools. And so you make a bad situation even worse during the summertime. And so, and that's, and the river really does feel that. And so that's why a lot of people think, why would we take the dam out? We need to save whatever water we have, when in reality, it goes back to some of those water quality concerns that I mentioned. You know, the pond behind the dam is not an oasis during drought time. It's actually, it's more equivalent to like a pot of boiling water. I mean, it's not that extreme, but that water heats up even more. It's not an oasis for fish and wildlife. Um, fish don't want to hang out in there. They won't seek that area out. They really want to seek out cold water refuge. Um, and so, and, and, um, and so, and in addition, all that fish, the fish and wildlife that do live behind the dam are, are there in spite of the dam, not because of the dam. And um, the pond also would, people ask about this too, the pond would never be a viable drinking source for water because the state regulations are, believe it or not, stringent for drinking water. Um, and with that part of the river being downtown, it would never be able to be of high enough quality to be used for, for drinking water. <coughs> Um, won't the upstream look like a mud pit? Um, this is, we get this question, and I think every dam removal project in the country gets this question, very common question. Um, and because you see what's there now is looks like, it does look like an oasis, but in reality, um, you know, taking the dam out is just gonna restore it to a naturally free flowing river. It's gonna look like any other part of the Ipswich River that is not under the influence of a dam. And so um, if you've, you know, gone anywhere else in the river up watershed it's, there's wetlands there's plenty of wildlife all that wildlife will continue to be here in Ipswich following dam removal um, additionally there's evidence that um, when they built this dam they built it on top of a elevation change so not like a waterfall we're not going to uncover Niagara Falls but there's evidence that there was a ledge at this site so taking the dam out would actually restore that, so you'll, meaning you'll still see flowing water. There'll be this cascade feature at the dam. Um, and so that's, you know, there still will be something nice to look at. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier how this freshwater tidal marsh, so this taking the dam out, you'll get that too. So you get the daily changing of the tides. It'll be a dyna it'll look different, but it'll be dynamic. And I think it'll be, a, I think it'll still be an attractive thing to look at. And these are some renderings that um, are scientifically accurate renderings that um, we had prepared that show the river at a couple different um, 
stages. So the top would be an above average flow. The middle is your average flow. And the bottom is kind of an uh, uh, extreme low flow, I guess you could call it. So there's still water in it. <coughs> um, might be a little trickier to navigate if you're on a boat. But then again, that's why this is you know, a, a, a not frequent occurrence. But we show it just to show that this is going to be a dynamic area and water levels will change, they'll go up and down, so. <coughs> I also just wanted to show a couple pictures of some other projects in New England, some other dam removal projects, just because these things, they are hard to visualize sometimes. So this is the Nisitissit River in Pepperell. Um, this is obviously a before picture and next as an after picture, so looks like a river with some, you know, some marshy um, banks. And so, yeah, it recovered, recovered pretty quickly. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is uh, the Pasumpic River in East Burke, Vermont. Um, similar size dams, the Ipswich Mills Dam. Um, this is before, and then this is after. So, you know, similar where I think they uncovered kind of this elevation change where all those rocks and boulders are. So you still have that flowing water effect. Um, and addition, especially for the Ipswich Mills project, um, the river becoming fully navigable from upstream all the way up to the beach is a, that's a, that's a definite pro for a lot of recreators and kayakers and canoers too. So um, you can go to the next slide. Um, what about EBSCO? So I mentioned EBSCO a little bit. Um, we've all been working together since the inception of this project. Um, every step of the way, EBSCO has been a great partner. But we've really been concerned about what the structural integrity of that building looks like and, so, um, and how that might be impacted by, by dam removal. So, and, and until late last year, the biggest remaining question was what are, what are the supports that support the foundation of that building? Are they made of wood? Are they made of concrete? Are they made of something else? So finally, for the first time ever, we got in there last year and dug a pit inside their building to actually visually confirm what was under there. <coughs> um, you can go to the next slide. I think I put a picture. And so yeah, this is what it looked like. We actually got a pit dug inside there. It was pretty cool. And we confirmed that the foundational support structures are made out of uh, concrete, and so which is a better situation than wood. Um, wood, if the water levels were to change following dam removal, that wood might then be exposed to air, which then could be susceptible, susceptible to rot. And so since that's not the case, we have concrete, EBSCO is in a much better position. We feel better about the project. We're still actually going to do another pit just to really double check, um, but things are, going, things are moving along and I'm really happy with that, that partnership too. This is an important one too. Um, get this question a lot. Isn't the dam historic? And so um, I think I really relied on um, the other expertise that we have in this town. So uh, town historian Gordon Harris, the historical commission um, <coughs> that Laura's on too, has really been a valuable resource to to look beyond kind of the science stuff here and talk a little bit more about the cultural importance of the dam. And so, believe it or not, the, dam, the current dam that's there today isn't really that old. It was built in around 1908, most people believe. And so, and it's concrete blocks. Um, so even though there's been a dam at this location for much longer than that, the current dam actually isn't that historic. And so, I think, I'm just gonna read this part because I think it's, um, it's part of uh, the memo that the Ipswich Historical Com Commission shared with the town. Um, I personally got, got goosebumps reading it. I think it's a hugely um, impactful piece of writing. Um, so the, the commission used a historic lens to consider not just the last few hundred years of history along the Ipswich River, but also the many millennia that preceded it. The Ipswich River is far more than a ribbon of water dumping its contents into the sea. For 14,000 years, it has shaped the land, nourished flora and fauna, sustained the lives of indigenous peoples and European settlers, and was instrumental in the birth of our historic town. The commission believes that we can best preserve the history of the Ipswich River by freeing it from unnecessary, unnecessary man-made encumbrances. And to further this end, the commission is in favor of removing the Ipswich Mills Dam. 
So, and then in addition to that, I recommend everyone read this blog piece by um, Gordon Harris, historicipswich.net, the history of Ipswich Mill Dam and a natural his just a fantastic piece of writing that talks about the, the natural history of the dam. Um, how do we know this will work? And so uh, this isn't the first dam removal rodeo. These have been done across the state and the country and the world. And so um, prof we, you know, we have some of the best professionals in the area working on this, looking at the science behind it. Um, and then alternatively, I don't want people to think that you know, we're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole either because there are lots of cases where the benefits of dam removal do not outweigh the risks or costs. And in those situations, dam removal is typically not endorsed. And so that's not the case here. We have pretty much endorsement across the board, um, meaning that there's high confidence that this project's gonna succeed. Um, and, and we also know that fish will return too. In pretty much almost every instance where a barrier like a dam is removed, the fish come back almost instantaneously. They know, that they know when barriers are removed. Um, so in short, these are happening across the world because the benefits are real and with no real risks. All right, so I think that concludes the FAQ part. So what's next really is just, uh, so in October last year, the select board made a motion to hear from the public on this matter. This was following that town meeting vote that I mentioned. They thought that the, that the town meeting vote was good, but they really want to put it on the ballot. And so May 21st this year, the week after town meeting, there will be a simple yes or no ballot measure to see where people stand on this matter. So they haven't finalized the language or anything, but they've said that it's essentially be like, do you support the removal of the, pro of the Ipswich Mills Dam? Um, and before then, likely next month or April, is when we would submit that additional document to the state saying this is how we're going to test for the sediment and this is how the you know that additional information so um, that's pretty much the next the next big step and so um, let's see that might be it yeah that was it so um, definitely happy to take any and all questions um, I'm just going to get a little bit more water because that was more talking than I thought Neil, Neil, where, where do we get that poster? Where, where is my office? Those posters I just took off of American Rivers website. So yeah, they did a, like an art campaign, I think, for their nationwide work on dam removals that, they're, that they do. Um, this is just a little addition, and you can correct me if it isn't correct, but, but I think I read it in, in uh, a couple years ago when the Ipswich River was one of the 10 worst. Okay. There it is. Anyways, I, I forget it, but it was one of those environmental things, and it talked about the 10 worst rivers, and at the time, the Ipswich River made it into the 10 worst. And one thing I was explaining about um, when there's a dry season, when it's overly dry, if there's a dam and then it holds back water as it's, you know, as the level sinks, then there are going to be places where the river doesn't want to flow because there's nothing else feeding into it at that point. And, and so, you know, there are puddles, big puddles, but, and then they can evaporate and they also warm up with the sun. So it's not only the, the creatures behind the dam that get cooked a bit uh, and die, but also all the ones in those little puddles downstream who, that can't survive anymore. And then the problem, of course, is ecological because, you know, these are the food for those, and those are the food for the next ones up. Absolutely. I should have had you up here with me talking more, because <laughs> that's, I think that's a great point. Um, the, and that's, you know, the things, the animals that we, ever, a lot of people care about, the, the fuzzy animals that we can see, the beavers, the otters. Um, but the bugs, you know, the bottom of the food chain are really what's impacted the most by these types of projects, um, especially with this being a head of tide dam and with that abrupt shift from fresh to, you know, brackish slash salt water, you know, countless of unseen things fly over that dam every day and do not survive because of that change. You know, every living thing 
much prefers a gradual change from in that type of environment. So you're absolutely right. I think um, things that exist in those puddles, in those disconnected areas, um, yeah, during droughts that are made worse for outside reasons too, it's just, it's not a good situation. And um, you're right, it was actually yeah, American Rivers designated Ipswich River um, top 10 most endangered in 2021. Um, that was, you know, in the whole country. So alongside rivers with much bigger name recognition, uh, the Ipswich River was up there because of that, because of those reasons, so. How does the work that's being, that will be done on the river, how does it affect the people's houses that are sitting right on the edge of the river? Good question. Um, so do you mean do you mean upstream or downstream or both? Yeah. So yeah, there's um, so there's actually not too many houses that are right on the river, but upstream um, there's a couple neighborhoods, and so um, you know First Street, you know, over by Riverview Pizza and stuff, and so there's houses up there. For the most part, those areas um, are going to see a decrease in water level. So the wa current water level um, that's there because of the dam, those water levels are going to go down, and so they're actually going to have increased protection from floods upstream. Um, downstream, um, there's pretty much no impact, and so um, because of the type of dam that it is, the amount of water that comes in currently will be the same that goes out even following dam removal. And so there's no risks of um, increased amount of water, increased velocities, so increased speed. So there's essentially no risk to downstream um, downtown and any other um, residences or businesses that are that are downstream of there. So um, that's uh, yeah, that's essentially because of that just the type of dam that it is. It's if it was a flood control dam, a, a huge megastructure, then there would be some some bigger changes. But since it's a relatively small run of river dam, there's no expected impacts downstream. I think you said that the effects upstream would extend for about a mile and a half. Could you just sort of, uh, you know, in experiential terms, how far up is that? How yeah. far up from the Audubon sector? All oh, right. Is yep. You got it. Thank you. So the question was about, um, we said the impacts would extend about a mile and a half. So what, what does that mean in terms of the river? And that's a good question. I should have put a map up. So essentially a mile and a half is, not a lot of people know where our, our office is, our headquarters, but it's called River Bend. It's right on where the, the river takes a big bend. Um, and then upstream of there, there's a railroad bridge. Um, it's where the railroad first crosses. Um, and so it's well before the Autobahn. So it's, um, I'm trying to think of, it's before you get to Mill Road, um, so it's really not that that far up. And there's no there's so there's the after downtown Ipswich. There's pretty much there's not a lot in between there and the furthest upstream extent. It's the railroad bridge, um, the railroad embankment, our office and our dock that we have, um, and that's pretty much it. So. Oh yeah, by the time you get up to Willowdale, there's, you know, there's no impact. And well, well downstream of that, there's no impact from, from Ipswich Mills. I, I, get, I, I get loud voice. What about the, the new places? There's a, there's a dam there. Is there an other dam further down? Folk, so yeah, Foot Brothers has a dam off Topshield Road. Um, and then upstream of there, the next dam isn't for about, gosh, how far is that? 15 miles in Middleton. Middleton's the next main main stem dam on the Ipswich River. It's called Bostic Dam, um, and that's the one that we're we're looking to remove this year, actually. So that's the third highest upstream in the watershed dam. So there's only there's three dams on the main stem of the Ipswich. It's Ipswich Mills, it's Willowdale, Foot Brothers, and Bostic. And so there's lots more on other tributaries in the watershed, but those are the three that are on the main stem of the switch. Carol, I know you don't need the microphone. <laughs> well, okay. Hi, <laughs> Carol Busque from 27 Green Street. Um, I retired, moved here six years ago, and I have six windows overlooking the river right there next to the senior center, so in the uh, Whipple Annex. I'm very blessed <laughs> to um, my little perch. And the reason I mention any of that is because I'm now under the spell of the river. So in six years, it's running right outside my windows, and I became interested. I'm self-educated, 
I'm an avid volunteer at the Ipswich River Watershed Association. Um, what I have learned is the river um, now has advocates from every area you could possibly imagine supporting this project. The importance is, is uh, it's just out of this world. Everybody in the country is watching what we do next. And when I talk about the representation, I'm talking about Senator Tarr, who convened the Water Resiliency Task Force recently in the last several years, where every town in the watersheds, both elected officials and municipal officials, are now meeting on a regular basis. So we have this super network of people devoted to our river health. The river starts in Burlington, travels to 24 towns, 14 of which get their drinking water from it, and that doesn't count Salem and Beverly, who do also get their <coughs> water from the Ipswich River. It just flows through Wenham Reservoir, and Wenham Reservoir is built from the Ipswich, so you understand. Uh, and that's not counting the wells. And most importantly, our water regulations have not been updated for over three decades. And there are right now six pieces of legislation working their way through the State House, one of which is out of committee, which may very well pass, that discusses standardizing when towns can decide to withdraw to fill their own reservoirs. So there is a lot going on. And then finally, we have our new state rep, Kristen Kastner, who was the planner for over 20 years in Burlington, who knows town planning in, in a way that's just exquisite representation for us. She understands what, what is at stake and who the players are, so we can't ask for a better legislative team. But the pieces of legislation are very important to know about and to support in any conversations, any votes we're having. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, the, the water withdrawal issues could be a, a, an whole entirely separate presentation. There, it's one of it's the most complex issue that's uh, that we're facing currently. Um, and thankfully, that's my, my colleague, Aaron, who's working on that, not me. The, the dam is pretty straightforward. You know, in my mind, it's, it's pretty simple. But the, the water withdrawals, you know, there's actual politics involved. Uh, you know, water is a business. And so it's very complicated um, uh, matters to, but for the first time ever, we, you know, we have the most, we're, we, we're the most set up to succeed than, than we, we've ever been before. So it's, t it's a good, good time to be positive. Okay. <laughs> um, I read uh, recently, in fact, it was uh, something from the town saying that damming, removing the dam from the river is the most important thing on the whole East Coast. This was, and can you explain why? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if I remember that one, but I think there has been other outside agencies that have weighed in on prioritizing dam removal projects. So I think. Um, this might have been from the, the Nature Conservancy actually put out a publication where they um, ranked dam removal projects across the entire Atlantic seaboard and Ipswich Mills was in the 95th percentile for that and that's mostly because of a lot of the benefits that that I was talking about earlier so for the head of tide dams like Ipswich Mills are so impactful that when you take them out each one of these that has been taken out has just restored immense amounts of habitat, the ecosystem, and the benefits are just immediate and they're immense. And so I think um, that was put in that kind of high echelon of rankings because of um, where the dam is physically and how, how great of an impact removal would actually be on, on the ecosystem. So I think that's um, why it's such a high priority is that um, the, the fish particularly, I'm a big fish guy and I think uh, you know, we've seen, I've heard, I've read a lot of history about the history of fisheries in the Ipswich River, and it's really impacted me um, to think about the times, like I read some of Gordon Harris's things, and he mentions times where in the past, you know, you used to be able to dip a net in the river and just take, and it would just be full of, full of fish, full of herring. And so, you know, we're far from that, and I know that the dam is, is a piece of that. So I think um, removing it would really just go a long way to, to rectifying that. Right. 
so yes, Foot Brothers have been approached. They're definitely a, a critical piece in the overall restoration of the watershed. And so I mentioned a grant. It was the NOAA grant that we got from um, the federal agency, um, which has some money in it for Ipswich Mills, but it also has even more money in it for, for Willowdale Dam. And so the idea for Willowdale, since um, it's privately owned, and that's uh, the Foot Brothers' livelihood kind of depends on that dam, um, so removal wasn't necessarily in the cards at this time. And so what we're looking into is essentially building a bypass around Foot Brothers Dam. So if you've been around there at all, on the opposite side of Topsfield Road, is that's owned by Greenbelt. And so you can walk around, there's trails and stuff over there. And so we would actually build a bypass stream on that side of the river. Um, essentially it would just it would act like the river would. It would accept all, uh, you know, portion of the water from upstream during times when the canoe business is not operating. And so then you could direct flow over there, allowing for fish to migrate upstream during the critical times of the year. Um, so during their migration times. And so that's kind of the current, um, we're, we're kind of, we're pretty early on. We're looking at designing that. So that wouldn't be implemented until probably 2025 at the earliest. So um, that's, but that's kind of the, planned future for that for that spot. Well, I really, if, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, please. Would the vote in May actually impact anything? And if so, or if it passes, when would you? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Um, so the vote in May is actually, it's still non-binding. So the, the select board's really just looking to get input from the town. And so, but supposedly they're gonna, they're gonna then take a vote that is reflective of what the people say. And so if the people vote in favor of dam removal, they would then authorize it on their behalf. And they, I think it would happen pretty quickly. And so from there, then essentially we would just need to finish the permitting process like I talked about. And so um, that usually takes about a year. And so, um, so say, say the vote passes in May, um, permitting can begin, would probably extend until 2025. Um, realistically, yeah, you'd be looking at probably 2026 for actual dam removal if, if things go perfectly, which they n usually don't. But um, there's, a, yeah, so there's like the South Middleton Dam that I mentioned earlier, that's been in the works for 15 years, even longer than the Dam in Ipswich Mills. Um, and we're just talking about getting that done this year. But um, things are looking up in the state too. They really do want to make sure that these projects get done because they know how important they are. Yeah, so for actual cost of deconstructing the dam, um, the most recent e uh, estimate that we got was around half a million dollars. And so, um, and that would be entirely grant funded. Um, there's actually a pot of funds, it's called the National Fish Passage Program. Um, and the, the dam was submitted for for, for funding for that, and it ranked out as the number one project in the whole region. And so I think if if the vote were to go positively in May, the funding would be there, um, and, and it would be there pretty quickly, I think. Well, I really appreciate everyone's time today, and if anyone has any other questions that they don't wanna talk about, feel free to find me after, or come by our office, or send me an email, or whatever you'd like, but I really appreciate your time, and, and uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.